Anyway, I think a few minutes passed and we, uh, I think we'll get going now. Don't want to cut into Neil's time at all. Anyway, I'm Mike Gilliland. I, uh, I think I'm going to be chairing this session. So let me welcome our speaker, Niels, and if uh, you're free to introduce yourself briefly to the audience and, and we'll get started. This will be 30 minutes. Uh, you can enter questions during the presentation in the chat. We'll get to as many as we can at the end, uh, cutting at 30 minutes. And otherwise, just please follow up with Niels uh, by email or through the app afterwards with additional comments. So Niels, please. Thanks for the uh, thanks for the intro there, Mike. Um, let me see. Yes, this is all working. Um, so quick intro. I'm Niels Verhoeven. I'm um, engagement principal, Era Technology. Been 20 years in supply chain, roughly say 22, 10 in the line. So I've been supply chain director, integrated business planning manager, 10 years in consulting, and the last two years in, in technology. Been writing about planning and forecasting on my blog supply chain trends for about 10 years. And I've been uh, publishing a foresight for uh, since 2016. I'm also on the uh, board of advisors there, reviewing, peer reviewing articles, et cetera. Um, about ERA, <clears throat> we're the cognitive automation company uh, with a bold vision of enabling the self driving enterprise. Uh, four year old company, well funded startup, uh, we're global. And uh, yeah, we're actually, you know, following up on the on that on that on, on that on that vision of the self driving enterprise and I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit um and what we said there i imagine if we could transform from an era of people doing the work supported by machines to an era of machines doing the work guided by people you know i grew up from uh, <clears throat> in, the, in in the era of people doing the work supported by machines i mean well educated uh, but still spending a lot of time uh, tinkering with data, tinkering with systems. Um, you get some support by the machine, but you still have to do a lot of work yourself. And we're really seeing a change where much more can be automated in the background for the knowledge worker. Um, and so the knowledge worker can uh, can, can focus on, on more value, value added things. And that's what we're, that's what we're really imagining here. Uh, because we've entered a new era. We've entered a new era where we're automating physical labor. And you see here this beautiful uh, Ford line from 1913. Uh, so that's about 100 years ago. And now we see that all physical assets in the supply chain are, are close to near of the um, automation. Um, we see production lines automated. We see the warehouses automated. We see last mile delivery automated. Um, and that's, you know, we're getting near in that 100 years, we're near full automation in that physical end of the supply chain. The next step here is really automating the information-based knowledge worker. And so us, also the planners and forecasters. Um, <clears throat> and that will be a good thing. And I'll, 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 I'll touch on that. But that's the new era where we're entering. Um, for this to, to, to happen, uh, we require a new technology. Um, technology so far, um, won't be, be able to, to do full automation uh, of the knowledge worker. So we, we require new things like either intelligent automation, as defined here, and a combination of methods and technology to execute business processes automatically on behalf of the knowledge worker, yeah? or cognitive automation, as I call out here today, uh, augmentation automation of human decision-making in the enterprise. Um, Pascal Bournet, the author of Intel Intelligent Automation, the book, was also a colleague of mine, and I asked him, what's the difference between intelligent automation and cognitive automation? He says it's pretty much the same. Um, I would argue that in the definition of cognitive automation, um, the enterprise where I work in, it's often retail, uh, manufacturing, CPG kind of companies, and maybe intelligent automation, is, 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 it's a bit more broad. It can be in a hospital, maybe, or doctors uh, being being helped with uh, intelligent automation as well. Uh, it's important differentiation as well that it's not only uh, automation of the knowledge worker, but also augmentation, which means um, the technology helps a knowledge worker make better decisions and better actions. So that's a little bit in terms of the, the definition of this new technology. Now, why does this matter? Going back to the book of Pascal Bonnet, 
um, they estimate about a seven, uh, sorry, ten trillion dollar savings across the world yearly if we apply it as well. We can save ten million lives with smart intelligence around um, around helping doctors and operations, etc. Um, improve customer experience, improve employee experience. And my personal one, which I like, I, I, I uh, work a lot in food, um, improve the environment. There's a lot of waste in the supply chain, in the food supply chain. And I'm working at, at several use cases at the moment to identify waste early and prevent that in, in the supply chain um, uh, automatically. So this technology definitely matters. 10 trillion and 10 million lives. Um, these are um, big numbers. Now, this new technology, and we talk often about artificial intelligence, and uh, one of the commentaries I wrote in uh, Foresight this year, actually, I mentioned AI is here to automate the knowledge worker. I just want to uh, reframe that because artificial intelligence, it's, it's not enough. It will be an important aspect, but it's not enough. Why is it not enough? There's many reasons, but I'll call out four here. AI without data is just a mathematical formula. AI is mathematics in the end. If you don't have data, and AI can be pretty data hungry, you won't get good outcomes, which in businesses, data is, is often a problem. Um, if you have AI and you have data and you can create some intelligence, which is great, if you can't operationalize that in your day-to-day -day business, you have a brain in a jar, as I call it. You have some smart sitting somewhere, and that's what we often see with data scientists. They go out for, for three months, solve a problem, go back in the business, but that's not really operationalized, uh, that problem. Um, so that's a, a challenge for, for AI as well, to make it continuously part of your operation. If you do that, you still need to guide AI, you still need to orchestrate AI, um, throughout the decision-making process, throughout actions in the business. Uh, they are not always linear. Um, there's several steps uh, that are required before you include AI, after you, you have applied AI, that all needs to be orchestrated. Um, so this, um, you know, the new technology need to orchestrate AI. Otherwise, uh, you might use it, but it might go in the wrong way. And finally, you know, you still need that human touch um, AI without a human touch is a bit creepy, can be a bit scary if we don't apply our values, our purpose, our morals uh, around AI, our ethics, uh, we might go in directions we, we, don't, we don't want to go. Right? So AI purely only is not enough. Um, right? And those four areas we really need to solve if we want to apply cognitive automation. So to understand, predict, recommend, and act on behalf of the knowledge worker, we need to integrate those four elements. And we need to have easy data access. We need to be able to read data from uh, like dozens of underlying systems in enterprises, sometimes hundreds. Uh, we need to be able to write back our actions. Um, we need to have transparent science integrated in the operating model where a subject matter expert can actually use that science, not only data scientists, and so we need to see a democratization um, in this technology of, of science to be able to um, connect it with the, um, with the operations, what we sometimes call a class box algorithms, can't be a black box, not knowing what it does, it needs to be able to be worked with with, uh, with business, business users. Um, we need to be able to digitize the processes. We need to be able to orchestrate, orchestrate planning and decisions and executions around, um, around the um, science and the data uh, to be able to automate and augment decisions for the, for the uh, knowledge worker. And finally, we need organization change. We need a smart human machine interface where the human can guide the machine and the machine can either automate or recommend to the human on what to do. Uh, the machine should be able to um, learn from decisions uh, together with the human and, and need to be a good collaboration there. If we look at Kasparov's law and it was defines that if you need, yeah, you need a good 
process between human and machine to have a superior result. If you have a, a brilliant uh, human and a brilliant machine with a bad process, uh, you still have inferior results. So cognitive automation needs to bring all these four elements um, together. Now, one of my articles um, on autonomous planning um, in, in Foresight, I actually went through, okay, this is, this is uh, you know, um, we read about light touch planning, autonomous planning, no touch planning. So what's really good quiet? And so I just, um, <clears throat> in this article, I really thought like, okay, let's write down what is required. So um, let's, let, let's go through that because there's quite, quite some steps actually needed if you start thinking about it. Um, again, you need this common data layer. You need, um, if you want to do a forecast in a business, add a promotion, um, send that plan to supply, uh, check your capacity, check your inventory, make a production plan, make a production schedule. If you want to all automate that, um, you need to have many different types of information and you need, that need to be accessible in a common data layer. You need this, what we call a digital twin or a digitized process to make all those little steps, which I just mentioned, plus many more, um, they need to be automatically guided, uh, these process steps, um, to uh, support that automated planning. Um, you need to have integrated advanced analytics not only descriptive, what happened, not only predictive forecast or um, a forward plan, but also prescriptive, what, what should I do? Um, and, and some of those report of what happened might need to be sent automatically to some stakeholders who want to know of what happened or um, what, they, what they should do. We need to be able to apply goals. And here we already see that Autonomous planning still need a human touch because the machine can't always set its own goals. Goals don't always have to be logic. A business doesn't always want to optimize its, its EBIT or its, of its income. Sometimes it's willing to trade market share and make a loss. Uh, a machine can't understand that without some human guidance. So this is where a machine uh, still needs some input from, from a human. The machine need to automatically solve problems and there might be multiple scenarios to solve a problem um, from which it has to choose and it has to take that decision if we want to do autonomous planning all across what i just mentioned the forecast adding promotion optimized price go to a production plan all these decisions should be automated as well once the decision is taken it needs to be executed often execution sits in transactional systems like ERP systems. Um, so uh, this autonomous uh, planning system need to be able to write those decisions back. It needs to self-learn this, uh, this technology because when, um, when we make decisions and it might be not the optimal decision and uh, the machine should be able to learn if, if, it's, if it's autonomous. And finally, it needs to be able to self-maintain and the supply chain, lead times can change, um, you know, production batch quantities might change. Um, this self-maintaining and detection of changes in that and self-maintenance and need to be able to, um, and technology need to be able to do that as well. So it's not an easy feat if I just highlight uh, these elements of what's required really for autonomous planning and, 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 and forecasting. Uh, but we see this happening now. We see this happening now in the, um, in the market. Um, you want to provide it in one, uh, one platform, not in 20 different systems tied together. Ideally, you want it in one platform. And that's what I call the way three systems of intelligence, which I highlight in the, the article as well. Um, after wave one, uh, which started in the 80s, ERP systems, enterprise resource planning systems, uh, APS, advanced planning systems, which came, um, you know, to life really, uh, get momentum in um, just after 2000s. And we see now systems of intelligence, which actually can solve um, this, this, this problem. But there are limits to decision making in, in planning and forecasting. Um, and that's really driven by um, uh, several, several factors. Uh, which I highlight in, in one of my articles. So you've got frequency of decisions, you've got impact of decisions, 
you have got the granularity of decisions, the complexity of decisions, um, and the human involvement in, in decisions. So I, in, in sort of planning forecasting, I um, divide uh, two, uh, sorry, four decision types. Uh, one, operational decision. is really short-term decisions, high frequency, repetitive, uh, usually at a very detailed level, so low granularity, and usually with smaller impact. The decisions are smaller impact. Um, this is where we see high automations. Um, and we have it in, in execution already, as I, as I showed you, in production plans, et cetera. But we now also see that for the knowledge worker, um, any decisions or short-term forecast changes, stock transfer orders, or small changes in the supply chain, and we see that more and more being automated in the next sometimes days, sometimes weeks, and that operational horizon. This is where really where the machine leads and the human guides. You see a high process automation, high decision automation, and limited advice, limited decision augmentation, because it's just not the time for the human really to make all those thousands of decisions in that short-term horizon across a whole um, supply chain. Then we get into planning, and that's really interesting for us in terms of uh, planning and forecasting, uh, practitioners. Um, planning is a bit further horizon. Uh, it's less frequent, uh, sometimes at a higher granularity level, usually the higher impact the decisions you're going to make, and often with more complexity. And there's more variances which we have, taken, have to take into account. Um, and this is really where machine uh, human-machine collaboration becomes essential. Uh, we see still decent amount of process automation. However, decision automation declines. That becomes decision augmentation. So really where the machine advises the human, but the human still makes the decision. And this really where I see um, in terms of planning and forecasting, short-term operational, I think planners will be more and more automated will start to play a bigger role in this planning horizon uh, where we have to work together with the machine. Then we see strategic decisions. Uh, they're infrequent. Uh, they're usually at the higher granularity level. Uh, you look at like countries, you look at, you know, you look at big impacts. Uh, it has high impact and it has a high complexity in relations or dependencies and interconnectivities, uh, which the machine can't contextualize really. And this is where the human leads and the machine guides. Um, we don't see process automation here. I don't expect that. Um, no decision automation. Uh, the human still makes a decision. There will be some decision augmentation. There will be some scenario planning or war gaming where the machine can help uh, the human in st uh, strategic decisions, but it's really human led. Then we have the cultural decisions, what I call human-centric business decisions. So anything that involves human values, behavior, ethics, virtues, is where the human leads. Uh, for example, if I'm you know, taking over another company, merger and acquisition, the cultural impact of that. Um, if I wanna discuss my purpose, my vision, values and behavior in the business, and the machine uh, won't be really help, um, able to help me there. And so we see that the longer this planning horizon uh, goes the uh, the more there is human centricity in decision making, eh? so really limiting the automation uh, for for the machine. Um, and if I just take an example of uh, Unilever, which is also you know, one of our on our big clients, if we take Mark Engel, the chief supply chain officer, and he says that at the end, the end of the day, every dollar we spend on agility has a ten times return for every dollar we spend on forecasting on or scenario planning. Now, we might not like that, that forecasters and planners, but I think what Mark means here is really that short-term horizon where he wants to be agile, he wants to sense what happens in the supply chain, and it's a big one with two and a half billion daily customers, and they want to sense and react quickly to what happens in that supply chain. He talks about that operational horizon I just mentioned, not about the planning or strategic horizon, but really that uh, operational horizon. So that's an interesting observation. And Wendy Herrick, the vice president, digital supply chain, 
she says it's like treating this machine as part of your organization, part of your org chart. And it's interesting, Unilever actually has an organizational structure where a machine reports in a human. So we already see that happening. And they've clearly defined what they call where the human is in the loop, on the loop, or out of the loop in decision making. And out of the loop, as you can imagine, is full automation, human in the loop or on the loop, and it's more collaboration with the machine and uh, augmentation of the human. Hey, so you see some of those leaders in the supply chain, those big companies, they really start to think about the boundaries of automation and uh, augmentation and where the human has to be in the loop and uh, can be out of the loop. So just looking at the future of work here, the forces at play, uh, we see this knowledge worker still smiling and I think there's reason for that. Uh, but we see that um, we'll see increased automation augmentation in a knowledge worker. Uh, Pascal Bonnet uh, estimates that 42% of work can be automated and 84% um, of the work for, uh, force is impacted, um, he estimates. Um, we'll see a incremental need for human-centric capabilities. And as some um, consultancies are starting to estimate that as well, as more time is being freed up and more tasks are being automated, there's actually more time for a human to be human and apply human capabilities, uh, which is a good thing, I believe. Um, and finally, the third thing is human machine collaboration becomes essential. essential. It becomes a skill uh, which is required to uh, be effective in uh, the, the future of work, really. Um, so with the future of work and cognitive automation, uh, we see this knowledge worker who in the short term can make decisions automated at a speed, scale, consistency, precision, and endurance, which is humanly not possible. So really in an operational horizon, uh, this lady will become a super, super woman. Um, for the planning horizon, uh, she will have a digital brain that helps her make decisions when automation is not uh, possible or not preferred. And finally, um, the about 40% estimated by Pascal Bonnet of time that can be automated, she has actually time to be more human, to collaborate, to communicate, focus on strategy, or to coach people. And uh, so I think there's a lot of positives there. Uh, if we take the automation of the knowledge worker of the the frequent repetitive tasks and, 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 and give augmentation and uh, time back to the human, uh, to the knowledge worker to actually be uh, more, more human. Niels, so yeah, we're, oh, yeah. we're at 20, we're about, about 25 minutes. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm done. So, um, so what's next? And we already see this happening too. Um, what I, what I showed before is that, um, you know, we see all these physical assets being automated, production plants, uh, cars, trucks, uh, warehouses. What we see happening there now is that, uh, is what we call a, um, again, digital twin or digital replica of the total physical supply chain uh, with, you know, smart factories, smart warehouses, um, and you see that companies, again, like Unilever, they have all the sensors in the factory and they have a copy, a digital copy of their factory. And what they are going to do now is connect that digital copy of their factory with the digitized knowledge worker to make short-term decisions quicker and augment uh, decisions in the mid and longer term horizon. So that will be really a next step where um, those two uh, worlds will come together and I think that sort of becomes the holy grail of supply chain um, where you have a digital uh, digitized replica of your physical supply chain plus a partially digitized knowledge worker and and combine the two uh, so that's what we really will see in the in in, in the future uh, of supply chain and that's not too far too far distance really um, so yeah that's it for me I hope you had a bit of an impression there of um you know some of my articles uh, which are basically you know highlighted and then provided some context around you can go back and read them um or yeah open for for questions for questions too now great thank you 
we've got a few minutes left here. Uh, please, anyone wants to chime in with any questions or comments? I have a question about the scale of the companies at which this will this evolution will take place. What's your estimate right now of the the smallest company where this vision is near term? I mean, Unilever is large. Yeah. And, and mom and pop's grocery will not get there for a long time if they ever do. But where's the edge? Yeah, no, I agree with you. Look, the, 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 the biggies are starting with this. And really, we see this across the world. Uh, you know, we, um, it's the bigger companies who, of course, benefit the most because they're so complex. Humans just can't keep up with the thousands or ten thousands of decisions that you actually have to make. They just don't make them. So, um, you know, I can tell you that they are definitely starting the early adapters, um, and some of them are two, three, four years uh, on the journey already. Um, some laggards have not started yet, um, but yeah, when the, the grocery store around the corner, um, you know, I can't give you that answer. Uh, <laughs> I can tell you who started. <laughs> um, there will be a minimum size of of scale, I would say, for a long time um, that you require to for it to be to be beneficial, I, I suppose. Uh, um, yeah, for this type of technology. Thanks for the question, Tom. Okay, we're coming up on the bottom of the hour. Just definitely want to encourage you to reach out, uh, Sneels, through the the OVA app or through his email you see here below. And thank you very much for your presentation.